Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O'Culture, where the siren song of our apocalypse is about a magic dragon that lives by the sea. I am your host, Ryan Peverly, the character written into a story that's part fish out of water, part rom-com, and all Bildung's Roman. Welcome to the show, thanks for hanging. If you hit the old play button on this one, it's probably because of the name and the title. Gordon White is in the house, Mr. White, as he's known in the metafiction that is our current cultural narrative. But Mr. White is no reservoir dog in this story. He's the Humphrey Bogart of high magic, the main mage behind the oh-so-popular Rune Soup blog and podcast. You've read it, you've heard it, and if you haven't, well, you're in for quite the trip on this here starship. Gordon's mind is a cabinet of curiosities, and we pull out quite a bit of them here, including how we can rearrange our reality, the magic of fiction, artistic impulses, Game of Thrones, a game of tomes, and if you ever wanted to hear Gordon White speak in pro wrestling terminology, well, there's a bit of that too. So let's do this damn thing already and cast this pod off deep into the primordial chaos where the protocols of the Elder Scrolls read more like a legend on a map of Middle-earth than they do a plan of global domination. Enjoy. Alright, so Gordon White, thanks for your time. Really appreciate you being here. You're very welcome. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, man. Me too. So I should start out, you know, you are... You're the second most requested guest I've had since I've started doing this. Uh, second only to Alan Moore for some reason. Well, think... <laughs> that's uh, August Company. Yeah, but I, I don't think people realize how hard it is to book folks who aren't Alan Moore, let alone Alan Moore <laughs> himself. So, well, uh, I realize, Ryan, I feel your pain. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Although I do have to confess, I have a fantasy of you and Alan Moore engaging in discourse. So. If we can make that happen sometime down the line, we should definitely aim for that. Yeah, he's on uh, he's on the to-do list for this year. I know he's got a copy of Starships, so uh, That's I'm not sure if he's read it yet. But um, yeah, he, he's on the to-do list. We'll get there. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, I look forward to that whenever it happens, for sure. So let's stop talking about him, because he's not why we're here to talk. Let's talk about you. You need no intro to my audience, or at least 99% of them. But for anyone who is unfamiliar with you and your work, and I'm thinking of someone like my mom. So, you know, give us the, uh, let's call it the briefly trying to explain this to my mom version of who Gordon White is and what the Rune Soup brand is all about, because it really is a brand now. It's grown quite a bit in the past few years. Well, uh, if I was meeting your mother, I would introduce myself and say what a lovely son you've raised. And then uh, talk about I'm from Australia. I um, had a sort of proper career in international media. I've lived in New Zealand and and the UK and so on. Uh, I studied film, but mostly documentary. uh, And so I have a background in research methodologies that go along with that kind of narrative way of, of, I guess, conveying information. And that kind of combined with a very young early interest in magic and the occult and the paranormal and alternate history and so on. And over the years sort of meshed into uh, a career or a journey or a quest or something. And uh, and that's what um, the books I've written have been about. And of course, that's what Rune Soup's about. It's a, it's a chaos magic analysis and perspective of culture and magic itself and, and history and, and so on. And it, yeah, it seems to have uh, caught the current uh, a little bit. In the, in the last few years. But I think chaos magic in particular is a epistemology, whilst it certainly needs a kick in the trousers now and then, is, is ideally suited to, I guess, that kind of interdisciplinary mode of, of looking at new information and, and holding it up next to old information and so on. And that's, uh, and that's the journey. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned you went to film school and I almost majored in film. I opted for creative writing instead. But I am curious, you know, what was it about film that was so appealing to you? Did you see the magic in the medium even back then or was it something else? It's a good question. I think most people, I mean, I did a communications degree. Technically, it's a media arts and production degree. It's a good question. Probably, probably is the answer. Narrative and storytelling have been a very 
Well, the cornerstones of my life, um, I started reading at a precocious age. I first read Lord of the Rings independently at six, obviously didn't understand it and skipped a few bits, but that's where the journey with that kind of book began. So it was something like that. The degree I did um, split into, in the US, you'd call them majors. They, we don't really have the same sort of thing uh, in Australia, but you do have a sort of major and minor uh, area. And uh, that one, a communications, media arts and production degree seemed like it was suitably vague and yet suitably defined to kind of allow me to feel out uh, what I was looking for. And so some of it, I mean, in the 90s, it was called interactive multimedia. So some of the things we learned, which would become I guess, digital now, were how to set up touch screens for museum displays and, and CD-ROMs and all that, you know, exciting the future stuff in, in the 90s. But it also allowed you to kind of look at production techniques and film and so on. So yes is the answer. It was a story-led decision. Uh, it was my interest in that and the mechanics of it um, that made me pick that particular degree. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of odd. Uh, it's, it's sort of singularly unique in the range of film-ish things you can do in Australia because it's run by a bunch of old um, Sydney commie hippies who don't believe in exams and, and built the country's first film scanner out of Meccano and, and so on. So it was pretty delightfully wild and woolly and you could get away with uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, although in the kind of you know, Simpsons quote, Lechenko learn nothing vain. I didn't learn. I didn't learn what I thought I would learn there. But looking back on it, it's been it was a very useful, I guess. Yeah, use of my time. Definitely. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned narrative and storytelling, because that is that's my wheelhouse academically, professionally, I guess, with the podcast, too, here, you know, and that is going to play a large role in our conversation moving forward. But I want to back up just for a, a moment, you know, you you do have, as you mentioned, quite the uh, ingredient list over at Rune Soup. You know, magic, the paranormal culture, geopolitics, anthropology. There's a lot of great topics to cover. It, it really is, if you think about it. It's, it's everything worth covering, with the exception of pro wrestling, which I will let slide. But if we're being honest, we've been living in that sort of pro wrestling reality for quite a while, haven't we? Yeah, you could definitely take pro wrestling as a macro metaphor, as, as some sort of modern Gnostic take, because uh, yes, is, is the answer to your question. We have been living in an engineered spectacle, uh, and that is not a new revelation. Uh, that's something that the Gnostics were exploring in the first few centuries of the Common Era and so on. This, this, What is it about reality that makes it real? Who's running the shop? Is anyone running the shop? Do they have our best interests at heart? Uh, and yeah, they're just the temptations of distractions and so on. So yes, um, you could make a solid case for pro wrestling as Gnosticism or pro wrestling as a way of seeing the world. Do you think that that is naive of me to see the world that way? I don't think it'd be naive if you know that you're going to be wrong, uh, because I don't know that if we'd found the answer, we wouldn't still be looking. So I think you can. Uh, I don't think it's naive at all. I think as long as you, you can kind of go, well, these two things can look very similar. I might be wrong, but I'm going to see what happens when I hold them up next to each other. Yeah, and uh, just to show off my complete nerddom, I guess. Yeah, there is this term in in wrestling called kayfabe, which is the uh, you know presenting the the stagecraft as as real and authentic. And then you know there's the a term called breaking kayfabe, where you sort of pull the curtain back a little bit and show people that ah oh, yeah this is a performance. And I feel like that's where we've been the last few years. At least that's how I feel. Like I've seen things. You know, we have seen those moments where the curtain gets pulled back just a little bit. And you know, to this point, you had a. Uh, I had a great post at the, at the beginning of the year that I think ties in here that was sage advice for anyone looking to pull that curtain back or break that kayfabe in their own lives. And the post theme was changing exposure. I was just wondering if you could define that term for us. You know, what does it mean exactly? And how can we change our exposure to this reality that we're living in? In that case, it was uh, changing exposure to the changes in, in probabilities and, and life outcomes and just general trajectories. So the first thing you want to do and this is really hard. And people, uh, and I appreciate this, it's not the way humans are comfortable thinking, but you essentially need to scenario plan or be running multiple simultaneous models in your head. 
And people don't like that. People like to get very tribal about their way of seeing the world, whether it's political or esoteric or so on. And this, again, kind of comes back to what I think is, in in some sense, it's dissociative and callous, but it is a a very useful thing that uh, chaos magic of all the kind of Western systems available is, is good at, which is just be honest with yourself that there might not actually be one answer or there might not be an ultimate truth or or something. That's what you, that's the mind state that you sit in when you do things like scenario plan, because we are, you know, ecologically, politically, economically in a dramatic turning. And, and if you just run the scenarios of different trajectories there, you have to look at your life and, and go, well, am I Am I pivoting my exposure to the uptrends and and reducing my exposure to the downtrends? And this this isn't, you know, investment advice. This is, do you think food is going to get more expensive or less expensive between now and 2030? Do you think food is going to get more healthy or less healthy between now and 2030? Are you a sub-editor at a newspaper and how long do you think that job will be around for? And and this is the kind of thinking that people don't like to do because it is difficult. But when you do that, all of a sudden, and from a practical enchantment perspective, all of a sudden, this a, a whole new kind of array of magical targets shows up, which is, again, food and health and, and, and financial security and all this kind of stuff. And you are probably, just by definition, as we are in, in such a dramatic turn, you were probably not exposed to a sufficient number of the uptrends and and have too much exposure to the downtrends. And people don't they they don't like to hear that. And and because it's alien and because they want, you know, a, a hero to ride in and, and save them. But unfortunately that's not how it works. And the way you get there is to scenario plan. You don't need to get it's a it's this silly hobby and pointless. And this is almost a Gnostic solve. Uh, it's pointless to try and get to the bottom of everything that's going on. I mean, what what happens at that point once you've your conspiracy wall has kind of tied together all the different things? Are you going to march on Washington and demand them that it's going to get changed? That doesn't work. It will never happen. You have to look at it yourself and go, well, how do I adjust to these exposures? And it as a result, it is an interdisciplinary exercise. You mentioned all the different kind of topic areas that the blog tends to cover. This is the only way the future, you know, the jobs that are going to be the most popular and the best paid in five years time don't exist yet. So you can't look backwards for an existing map. All you can do is have a kind of interdisciplinary scenario planning approach and and just generally pivot your life to the uptrends. Definitely, man. Yeah. And I thought, you know, like I said, that was that was great advice for anybody. And I, I guess maybe I did interpret that in a different way. And I apologize for that. But, you know, to the same point. What, would, you know, what did you what were we talking about? Maybe I'm thinking of a newsletter. Well, where did you think no, that was no, going to go? I don't know exactly. But I, I think I was ah. I, think I remember a uh, a specific point in that blog where you were you were talking about like there was a list of bullet points i think that you had pulled out and it was like things like inflammation and you know it's like a lot of oh yeah so those would be the uptrends yes Yes. absolutely healthcare particularly in the u.s um although the uh, much lauded and rightly so nhs and and other kind of you guys call them socialized medicine, which is not correct, but um, they're being gutted around the West as well. So healthcare is getting worse and more expensive. This is one of those uptrends. You go, well, I will die of something and everything that kills me has indicators that show up beforehand, like inflammation. So it makes sense as a pivot to say, well, I'm going to prioritize um, reducing inflammation uh, from a dietary perspective, from a body movement perspective, from avoiding substances perspective. This is the uptrends you have to pivot to because you will die of something. You will get sick. It happens to everyone. But the way you adjust to the fact that you don't know what's coming and also you don't have you have decreasing rather than increasing confidence in the medium term world. It's all up to you. And and I mean, that's the good news, frankly. The good news in in this kind of bizarre time is um, if you get your head in the right place, you have you've never been in a better position to pivot to those to those uptrends. Yeah, and this is why I brought that up. You know, I, I like the fact that you know you're giving practical advice here. I mean, it's it's a nice, comforting reassurance, I think, to let people know that they do have some power over their lives and the world they live in. You know, like m- maybe not at the macro level, but definitely at the micro level, right? Yeah, or maybe they don't have power at the medium level because the other good news of you eventually getting sick is that you'll also eventually die. Like the true core of you is incorruptible and and cannot be killed. 
uh, it, it cannot be destroyed. Uh, you can only give it away. And so the good news is at the macro level, it all works itself out. And at the micro level, you have tremendous sovereignty over, because of that macro level, because you have some kind of whatever you want to call it, spark of the divine or so on. But by virtue of that, at a micro level, you have tremendous sover- sovereignty. It's just in that medium layer, which surprisingly everyone, or unsurprisingly everyone focuses on, we, we get trapped in that, in that spectacle. Uh, in that pro wrestling spectacle and miss the power we have and also the fact that literally in the end uh, it's a good news story i bet when you got on this call you did not expect to say the words pro wrestling in response to something that i asked you (laughs) not as many not as many times as we have no (laughs) oh shit okay well i promise that's probably the last time it'll come up but hold on Uh, now now you say that and i'm just gonna keep bringing it back to pro that's totally cool man that's totally cool so with all this in mind you know let's do a bit of multiple choice i have three sentences here and choose one you think is the truest and, and please explain why you chose it so number one we are living in the most breaking kayfabe moment in human history that's the you know pulling the curtain back a little bit moment number two we are living in the most crucial to our survival moment in human history and number three, fuck this noise. This sort of thing happens all the time. Mm, that's tough. It's a good multiple choice question. Probably recorded Western history. If you said breaking kayfabe in modern history, that would be A, because there have been, you know, large scale events that make you realize. So the fall of Rome would be a good example. Rome wasn't supposed to fall. Like that's a, that's a, that's a similar collapse of a universe because Rome wasn't supposed to fall. And we're kind of experiencing that with the fall of the new Rome. So if it was a modern history, I'd go with A. Um, It does happen all the time, but I do think there is something, this fourth turning for one of a less problematic term, pivots on a dramatic change in how we see the world and how we structure information in the world. And that is experienced everywhere. That's not just political. Physics is in complete crisis because it's still stuck sort of clinging to 19th century materialism. Biology is in the same situation. And, and we're seeing in various private space programs around the world, there is tech that doesn't match official physics. So everything is breaking. There's a, there's a serious kayfabe incident happening because how we structure information in the world is going to be very different in a few years' time. So it is a pain point. It is, uh, But again, you just have to ride through it. It's a thing that happens now. Uh, it's not necessarily the end of the world, but it is, uh, uh, it is the end of how we structure information in a world. So in a world like this that we are in right now, how important is something like narrative and storytelling or art in general how important is this to our future i don't think we can avoid storytelling or narrative and uh, i'm in good company on that so it's something terence mckenna said which is well why is the universe shaped like a novel and and i think that's profound to think with but also i've had dr jeff jeff kripal on the show and uh, he says why is the world or the universe structured linguistically and that's a sort of similar way of saying the same thing and when you kind of pull it back and realize the reason we currently in the west don't think or, or don't conceptualize the universe as some form of narrative as, as structured linguistically is this sort of artifact of of a theological argument with amnesia, which is the Enlightenment and, and the rise of materialism and, and Cartesianism and so on. So we've kind of had a head trauma about 200 to 300 years ago, and, and we've mistaken that wrong-headed view of the world for reality. The rest of cultures around the planet have carried on without this head trauma, and they do see it as that. So I don't think we we can't not experience and describe the universe in a narrative fashion. Uh, And I think that's a hugely significant philosophical statement. I think uh, if you look at the phenomenologists and so on, they're playing with this reality that in some sense, the reader and the storyteller is fundamental, literally fundamental to the structure of the universe. So there's that. But in terms of art, well, that's different. Art is extremely important now because it is as we get to the end of the sort of materialist hijack, what you're experiencing is this really kind of low resolution ersatz culture. And that you, you I mean, if you did film or you're, have, you're interested in film, if you look at what's going on in television and, and film and even novels, we'll put them to the side for now, with a tremendous amount of reboots and, and a backwards lookingness. And the backwards lookingness is because it's scary to look 
forward at the moment. That's why you need a scenario plan. So we're getting there is there, there is insufficient ambition in art, and what does come out is recycled or ersatz or, or so on. And again, we come back to the good news piece. It's literally never been less expensive or less costly to create good art from literary novels to paintings to music or whatever you want. It's never been, and this is kind of how you, you sort of smell fate in, in situations like this. We've never needed it more and it's never been easier to do technically, but it's possibly never been harder to do uh, emotionally or creatively. Now that I open the chaos protocols talking about the Kali Yuga, because that's what interests me about the metaphor of the Kali Yuga uh, applied now is in, in other epochs, you have to spend potentially centuries reciting mantras to kind of break out of the circle of rebirth. But in the Kali Yuga, you only have to say the mantra once and you are guaranteed at some stage to essentially achieve enlightenment or, or get out of the circle. And in art, we have a similar thing going on now. It's never been more important. It's never been technically easier, but it's never been emotionally or creatively more difficult, at least in our lifetimes. Can you expound on that last point? Why is it so difficult? Well, because we're not very good at thinking with art at the moment. We're not very good at understanding that it is sacred and it's, it's the first thing we did. Like art and magic, this is the Alan Moore conversation, uh, art and magic come from the same impulse and probably far enough back down the timeline are the same impulse because it is the creation of something that didn't exist before. It's the rearranging of reality, but rearranging of reality embedded with meaning. So it is the same thing. It's just that we're not very good anymore. Culturally, we're at a point in the timeline where we honestly believe that meaning isn't embedded in the universe, which is idiotic and, and unique to us in, in terms of cultures and in terms of periods of history. So there's a sort of what's the pointedness uh, to it and, and, a, and a lack of faith in the transformative power of both experiencing art and probably more crucially creating it. So it's, it's a magical act. It is literally magic. He, uh, Alan Moore's right on that. Uh, and that's why it's hard now, because the prevailing cultural narratives, there's that word again, don't let us recognize the actual power of creation and art. That's where I was trying to get to with this, because, you know, one of the major narrative themes that runs through the podcast here is that art is essentially the highest form of magic. It is also magic in and of itself, but it's also the highest form of it, if that makes any sense. And, you know, the more that I read about general creativity and magical practices, the more that this just feels true to me. Because, you know, art and magic are really both about introspection, if you think about it. Yeah, it, it's certainly the most potent form, but it's also it also can be the most dangerous because it is the, the use of images and false narratives and so on that kind of constructs the proverbial black iron prison. I agree. I just think there is... What you what I suspect you're grasping at and and feeling for is a similar thing I'm feeling for when I talk with the premium members about say big table animism, which is we need a new model because the rest of them have uh, are at the end of of how we kind of cohere all this stuff together. So how is art different from creating something else? And I phrase that deliberately so that do aboriginal cultures consider their cave paintings art the way we do most cultures around the world and throughout time don't separate nature and culture so we do and that's that's an imperial hijack and so we went out on our ships from europe into quote unquote nature to look at quote unquote cultures but for most of humanity for most of uh, the time we've been around this this is an artificial distinction and here's a better one these cultures don't have novels so you don't write a fiction and a nonfiction book. This is another arbitrary distinction we've had. You couldn't run a Barnes and Noble in the Amazon because you wouldn't be able to put books anywhere because there's just story. There's just creation. And so what I hear you saying there is a similar quest to the one myself and the premium members and whoever wants to join uh, is on, is at a baseline level how we validate knowledge. So our baseline epistemology is, is out of date and broken. And we are bodily and almost unconsciously feeling for how these these new things have to come through and it's it's a it's a description challenge more than an experiential one and that's the bit that i'm i, I want to kind of emphasize to people that epistemology you were raised in is wrong it's wrong 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 and so to look to it to to describe what art is or what it can do is also wrong 
I don't know how it shapes out. I do think this is going to be the story of the 21st century. Uh, I think the 21st century is going to be biology century. So it is about shifting the ontological emphasis away from physics, which is the 20th century story, and, and atoms and nuclear bombs and so on, into into life and experience. And And I think the best thing and the highest thing that life can do is create art. I would agree with that. And you said something a couple minutes ago during that answer that uh, you actually took the next question right out of my mouth. But I'm going to pose it anyways just to make sure that we're on the same page here. I want to talk to you about specifically fictional storytelling because it is a uh, probably my major interest and it's one I, I've always sort of gravitated towards. And you said that it was it was magically potent. That's, I think, the, the way that you described it. And that was my exact question was, do you think that fictional storytelling is magically potent and why i don't know if there's anything more to add to that but well uh, ryan what's your favorite novel oh man okay so i would say oh it's so hard gordon you know those questions are impossible to answer but yeah you're gonna get you get, have a <laughs> have a few stock answers so that you can answer the follow-up question just keep them in the back of your head yeah 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 i would say there are probably two i really am a fan of catch 22 have you read that no but i know what you mean yeah, yeah. And um, this other novel called House of Leaves, I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Oh, no, I read that. I read that within a week of it coming out in the 90s. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I, I was uh, all over that too, so, for sure. Yeah, a great book. And held up well. Anyway, that's has, sort of has. beside the point. If you look at – here's the other thing. Uh, I'm very interested in – the mythicist position when it comes to looking at the history of the early church and the apostles and so on, which is the mythicist position is that there is absolutely no archaeological evidence for Jesus ever existing as a physical human. So what does that say using our categorizations of the Gospels and the New Testament and the Apocrypha and the writings of the church fathers? Is that fiction if it didn't happen? And consider how that's rearranged the world. Uh, and crucially, when I say if it didn't happen, I mean if it didn't happen in the physical. I think what people miss is most of the early Christians had a Shepherd of Hermas idea of Jesus as not being embodied, right? So anyway, that's beside the point. And so stories can shape the world. The challenge is, what is fiction then? Remember, this is a Western-specific categorization that is based on us kind of reductionizing, if you will, uh, all of reality and kind of pinning it to little chalkboards in the Natural History Museum. So um, for something to be fiction or nonfiction, the nonfiction category has to match to empiricism. So it has to be describing physical things that have happened. This is why you don't find the divide in sort of non-empirical cultures and even our own culture if you go back far enough. So why wouldn't fiction be transformative? Like we've got, uh, we have errors in our categorization. What you're asking is, it comes back to the fundamental nature of reality. You're asking, can stories change the world? And and fiction can be filled with potency. A lot of it's bad, like there are bad stories in the world or stories that maybe need more cooking or, or another rewrite. But if you think about people sitting around campfires for the last one and a half million years, and if you think about in classical Greek cultures, first exposure to, you know, the Homeric tales uh, as a kid, which you would have, I mean, if you were wealthy enough, you would have read them, but you otherwise would have had them told to you and, and so on. What you get with quote unquote fiction is that resonance to, to story and to you and to how that matches the universe. It's how we learn and experience and, and put this information out there. To say that fiction can't change you, I mean, Ursula Le Guin died, this, uh, Le Guin died last week, so very sad about that. But she famously said, the people who don't believe in dragons are often eaten by dragons from the inside. Potent fiction means you don't get eaten by dragons. To say it doesn't, to say it can't be empirically verified is a really dumb way of asserting a truth claim for something. Where do the stories come from otherwise? I mean, what is the unconscious? It's our European imperial modes of categorization, which have given us some good things uh, and will continue to give us some good things as long as we can see the edges of it as a belief system. If you try to bring that to the first and most important thing we do, which is create, then you just, you, it's a car crash. So you mentioned two things in there that are my next two points of conversation. Did you see my notes before we started here, man? It's sort of sync. I did not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But before we get down that path, so is mythology, and I'm going to keep using these these Western labels because I just don't know any better, but is mythology... No, but it's, it's good we do because we can talk using them right. and also have the discussion about their edges. So what's the line between mythology and fictional storytelling then? Is there a line or are they the same thing? 
I don't think there is. I, I think there's you can replace that with stories of increasing and decreasing potency because there isn't that there uh, there isn't that definition in Aboriginal cultures or in uh, you know Papua New Guinea or somewhere. There's no you don't kind of put well that one's mythology um, because those are stories we tell ourselves about culture and these ones are fiction because those are well what exactly what is a novel if not a story we tell ourselves about culture like honestly what is it so i think uh, it's almost like we are attempting to categorize on a horizontal axis when what we need to be looking at or maybe a vertical what we need to be looking at is a spectrum of story of increasing and decreasing intensity or, or potency now we've had in the west a number of attempts to frame this so we can think with it and for my money the best one is Jung and subsequently Joseph Campbell and and so on uh, Jung with his archetypes and and people miss that uh, the archetype discussion if you haven't actually gone right back to Jung and read what he said and he said a lot of stuff because he lived a long time and he was working on these his unconscious and archetypes theory for decades so you also got to pick Jung at the right time to get what he's really saying but what he's saying is very much what Dr. Kreipel or Terence McKenna uh, is talking about which is the entire universe runs on story shapes and, and the archetypes are self-aware story entities that are kind of based on much e even deeper yet bedded into the universe clusters or shapes of information that express themselves in the unconscious as stories. So with novels, I mean, you know, the Middle Earth books, uh, Lord of the Rings and so on, that maps to a hero's journey shape, that maps to all this kind of stuff. And they've been, so how is that different if it is built of the same kind of embedded information shape in the entire universe to hero stories that we would consider religious uh, so well we wouldn't consider religious unless we do um the odyssey and you find similar things in you know the bhagavad gita or so on how is that different how is and that's joseph campbell's point with something like star wars how is it different how is the hero's journey different if it's mythology or fiction that's the 20th century's realization the 21st century's opportunity is to plug that in with more typically magical things so folding that into parapsychology and psi research and, and the fact that, OK, so there's a fundamental kind of story shape to I, I don't even want to use culture anymore because culture and nature and artificial divine. There's a fundamental story shape to reality. And when we tell stories or when we think with stories, we shape reality. We know that from from psi experiments. So it comes back to how is fiction described to me how fiction is any different to mythology and and we don't we don't do that right we we need to have a some stories will affect you and affect the universe more than other stories so it's a potency less potency spectrum rather than a real fake spectrum what's your favorite novel then well see this is i kind of have official answers on that um, and like maybe not unfortunately i mean it's amazing but realistically it is lord of the rings in terms of the long-term impact it's had on my life from sort of the first thing i've read to now and the fact that it because it is so archetypally potent you will get something new about reality every time you get into it what's your favorite novel post 1970 ah uh, see I'm not prepared for that one well, we don't have to answer it. It's totally fine. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just because all my like what I'm doing in my memory is working out which book, like what books do I have? I read the most times, if you will. And it's going to be something odd. Like I, I, as a kid, I read Jurassic Park like 30 times. And I'm like, that's oh, probably wow. not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's I'm going to think on that one. Right, maybe well, maybe the yeah. answer will come back to me by the end of the show because sure, sure, I want to yeah, have yeah. a good let's, answer. For let's it. go ahead and uh, table that one. So I assume you watch Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read A Song of Ice and Fire, the series, but it's not really relevant here. It sort of is, but I just caught up on the last season. Uh, I, I was a bit behind. Like I, I literally just watched the last episode of season seven here, probably like a week ago. So it's fresh in my mind. But I wanted to revisit something from Starships regarding uh, the House of the Dragon and your archaeology of dragons presentation that you gave. I think a couple of years ago. Having that context of your work has made Game of Thrones a, a bit of a different viewing experience for me. But the thing is, I I don't know if this narrative that I'm watching unfold on this TV series, I don't know if I do have the right context. I mean, obviously, it is retelling some sort of mythology that involves dragons, but I'm wondering if what you've written and spoke about is similar to the myth that they're weaving into this mainstream pop culture narrative? 
I think, well, so Game of Thrones is essentially a retelling of the War of the Roses, which is a period of English history where different noble houses were competing, and they both had roses as their emblems, uh, were competing for the throne. So that's what George R. R. Martin was writing, or is writing, or how, whatever he's at now. I rather suspect the dragons picked him rather than he picked the dragons, because it, I, I like that you said that you have a kind of archaeology of dragons, starships perspective on the appearance of dragons in the story now, because they certainly run, you can certainly look at the appearance of dragons and what they signify in, in Westeros or in, in the entire world of the series. And you get the stuff that he's trying to do, but I can look at it and see stuff that he's not aware he's doing, which is what happens when you tangle with dragons or what happens when you tangle with elves or so on. And it comes back to the fact that these are real non-physical forms they are things uh, or persons uh, whatever you want to call it so I, I know what you mean if you think that's interesting that i mean he could bring the the royalty dragon match himself because you get a lot of draconian motifs associated with royalty through history and mythology and so on so that kind of makes sense but nevertheless there is an additional potency about getting dragons right that is associated with right kingship or rulership because it will inevitably be a queen that I'm not sure. I think that's just what happens when you go to create with dragons as as a writer or, or a filmmaker or so on. So I know what you mean. You look at it and go, huh. Having looked at a few interviews or read a few interviews with George R. R. Martin, I don't, he's literally got a dragon by the tail. I don't think he knows uh, that's what happens. But that's, that's how Lord of the Rings – well, that's how Hobbits emerged. They emerged from a line Professor Tolkien wrote on the back of an exam, exam response when he was marking them late at night in A Whole Day Lived a Hobbit. And he wrote that down so I have to work out what a Hobbit is. So that's what happens when you do story, right? It, you're excavating in a way. So what would the proper context of – the dragon motif be here in 2018 in our our kayfabe-esque reality i think you have to go all the way what the dragon is requires you and that's why i call the presentation and archaeology of dragons you have to go all the way back to the earliest moment we can find dragons in and they're right there at the beginning large reptile monster forms and what they are is chaos and and chaos in the good sense um chaos is a rainforest or a reef or or potential uh and that's why the kind of slaying the dragon story motif is is so far back the timeline and so deep and and so universally applied because it is so old that's the story of Essentially, if the if the monster or the dragon is is the universe, the the culture hero rearranges the whole thing to make the world. So all of creation is is a rearranged body of a dragon, if you will. So the dragon is potential. Uh, it's potential that doesn't have our structure or the application of our capacity to do things like make art and decisions and and move about the universe. That is the human slaying the dragon story. So you have to kind of find it all the way at the bottom and realize that it is ever replenishing potential it is permanently pregnant potential and i so the, here's a good example right so mother of dragons as a title so going back to game of thrones mother of dragons or mother of monsters is is a sumerian title for for what we're talking about and that's interesting i'm not sure if he knew that i'm not sure if he was going the entire way back to you know the epic of gilgamesh to to get that but Probably not. It's just that that's what happens when he's tangling with the dragon as a form. So the dragon is is chaos. And for us to kind of, if you will, get right with the dragon, we have to follow that story to the end. Because crucially, the next step is what I just said, the rearranging of reality. And this is where I think kingship and, and, and dragons go together. Because when you say like a culture hero or a king, or in this case, a queen, controls dragons or is, is in some way associated with them, what that means is that person runs reality. That person has rearranged all of reality. Now, I suspect, even though it's probably not conscious, if you look at the dragons in heraldry going back through time, that's probably not a conscious match, but it is almost an archetypal match. What you are saying with a dominance of the dragon is that what I say about reality goes, and that's a very useful power for a king. It's a very useful power for us. So once you get to what the dragon is and understand what that entanglement is, you can do it. It, it doesn't need to be 
if anything, it's worse when it's a royal power. It's it's a it's something you can do. You can rearrange reality in that sense. So that's what understanding the dragon, I guess, offers. And and because it is potentiality and because it is uh, unformed or unknown things, it recurs throughout time and is associated with UFO events and, and, and all kinds of stuff because it is such a big, old and important person, archetype, idea, whatever word you want for it. Yeah, I like the point you made in your presentation where you said cultures who have dragons will see dragons and cultures who don't won't see them. And that's pretty obvious. And that goes back to, I think, the uh, Jacques Vallée hypothesis, right? The uh, Magonian, everything is a product of human consciousness type of thing, right? Sort of. It's probably closer to an Italian anthropologist, uh, Ernesto Di Martino, who looked at Italian folk magic and also Brazilian magic and so on and, and determined that cultures that have a belief in magic get more extreme magical events or effects. So uh, that's kind of where one of the things you can do to make the draconian potent in your life is to kind of do what we're talking about here, feel out a worldview or cosmology that will allow these things to have the reality that they do have. And in many respects, you're 60% of the way there then. Um, So on an individual basis, you kind of have to have one of these DiMartino style cultures that allows for the miraculous and, and, you know, just general magical effects to happen in one's life. Is there an intersection then between these dragon myths and motifs and the the general, you know, serpent or reptilian stories and myths? Probably. From a historical perspective, probably. If you look at the earliest snake motifs, and these probably, and this is in starships, we presume came out of Africa with us when Africans started colonizing all of non-Africa about 120,000 years ago. Because what you find in Australian Aboriginal cultures very commonly is the rainbow serpent motif, which is that the land is shaped by this giant snake, um, which also then departs. And what uh, I rely on uh, Dr. Witzel's work uh, on the origins of the world's mythologies in a couple of chapters in the book. And what he did is quite clever is sort of go up the family tree of of motifs and, and kind of guesstimate some timelines. And what he did then was entirely speculatively, but with, you know, a good grounding in, and, and background is attempt to build a guesstimate of what a what a human's belief system was 150 to 200,000 years ago. And it has a kind of snake or um, devil figure coming from the stars to kind of teach mankind how to do things and then leave. So again, that's that interplay with potential and, and how to reshape the world associated with a reptilian form. Now, the challenge is, it, it's sort of weird to carve them up in this way after what we just said, but the snake or the serpent is itself a standalone and very potent archetype. So Probably they were the same thing at one point, but if you will, practically or or functionally, the serpent is a separate form to the dragon. The serpent is almost like a civilized dragon because it does, and that's why we have it in the Bible, right? It it does give us that capacity to think with and, and reshape the world. So there's something about the dragon in many respects, and don't take this just take this really lightly, but the dragon in many respects becomes the serpent in the act of rearranging. But archetypally, you're dealing with two separate forms there. And from a magically operant perspective, you're better off dealing with them as two separate forms and just subsequently thinking with how they might play together. Well, that's interesting because I I was thinking about that serpent in the garden story, obviously. So if the dragon becomes the serpent, is, is is that essentially maybe where the hijack took place then? If they sort of... I don't know if I'm phrasing that right, but do you see what I'm trying to get at? If the dragon evolves into the serpent, and that serpent in the garden story is sort of the basis for, you know, Western religion or spirituality, I mean, would they have just taken that dragon motif from cultures before them and then sort of molded it or evolved it into that serpent myth? Well, everything that's in Genesis, well, there are two creation accounts, but everything that's in Genesis you will find in Babylonian and Sumerian stories. So it's already a a pastiche at that point. And if you can find them in Sumo, they're 20,000 years old. Um, They're they're Laurasian, to use the terms from the book. I think the hijack happened at the Laurasian point. So when, when... at some stage between 35,000 and 50,000 years ago, if the Witzel hypothesis holds, and I follow this fairly closely, and you know all the kind of Gobekli Tepe stuff suggests that he's more right than he is wrong. At some stage, we moved from having what he calls a forest of stories, which is living in a, a living universe that has many concurrent stories or dreamings for different animals and different tribes and different places and so on. At some stage in that time period, we built the first novel. 
So we start thinking with and describing the universe as as a sequence of events from the creation of the universe to its eventual and very often imminent destruction. So it goes from yeah, Genesis to apocalypse. And, and that's where I think the hijack is. I think that's when you get some very clever shamans on the make. Uh, you get some very clever tribal warlords if they were separate people and they sort of presume to turn around and mansplain the universe and and kind of make that shape in and it, interestingly i think especially as the majority of culture here is the defeat the dragon a male i think we can kind of see that actually happening i think what you get at about the 35 to 50 thousand year time is what is sort of the paleolithic renaissance so you, you started to see an increase in cultural complexity in paleolithic cultures so something happened Something happened that allowed us to tell stories that shaped the universe in a different way, and we did start to get structured society and so on. So I don't know. I do think the hijack is is all the way back then. I do think there's a memory of that, even if it's not a conscious one, in the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent and so on. There's a memory of we used to we used to live differently, and now we know things. And, and and are in some sense separate from the non-human world because of the things we know. And that's what I think the, the writers of Genesis are trying to get at. It's this memory we used to live differently. Now we don't. And why is that? And and that's all kind of contained when you again, because it's creation and, and, and storytelling, you have to go in there and, and tangle with these motifs and, and that's how the story sort of subsequently emerges. Last question on the dragons then. You know, obviously if you get a little new agey and you talk about serpent energy and kundalini and those kinds of things i'm curious what you think of that is there something to that do we have this 100 percent. there's something to that 100 yeah? percent. Okay. yeah um so i have in i think it's in pieces of eight but i kind of have a, a welsh transliterated and uh, english translation of the hoophis um from the greek magical papyri which i've done in certain draconian potent places in britain but i absolutely think that not only do I think there's something to it, I think it's recommended. This is coming, this is how you incorporate the draconian, and and I mean that in a positive chaos sense. This is how you have that permanent upwelling of chaos as rainforest or, or life or potential in you. That's, if if you want to do kundalini yoga, go for it. If you want to do ho office, go for it. Engage practically and, and in a physical and embodied way with this form the descriptions of it are goo that's fine all our descriptions are going to be goo but don't let that stop you and if you if you land on some kind of purple website some old geocities holdover that has some kundalini tech mm-hmm. that you think i might want to play with this don't let the purple stop you i i yeah i, I honestly think people should get right with this form is is maybe the best way of describing it Definitely, yeah. And is it a possibility then that the Bible and and other texts that describe these these serpent myths, I mean, could that be sort of the the blueprint that they're expressing to us and you know through these symbols and and archetypes? Yeah, they they can't not. And that's where and it, it's sort of an interesting intellectual area in the last say ten years of the grimoire revival. It's uh we went through particularly in the U.S. in the second half of the 20th century a ersatz rejection of ersatz Christianity or churchianity uh, because it's typically people who grew up in things that don't in any way resemble what Christianity should look like in its original expressions in Europe. And so there's and and after that you get a kind of like low resolution and as a result mostly inaccurate uh, feminist descriptions of it being this really basic idea of it once being maternal uh, or and, and now it being patriarchal and all that kind of stuff and that's unfortunately for people who have maybe held on to that way of seeing the world for too long going through the grimoire revival makes you realize that in fact the stories and all these forms female forms demons angels serpents and so on are there in their potency and aliveness in the way we've done witchcraft and magic for 2000 years and the hijack wasn't there the hijack wasn't some sort of imposition over um, the top of a of a benign pagan europe with this uh, external patriarchal force it wasn't like that at all these stories if you can get them to as i said if you take them to babylon and sumer then they're 35000 years old so it's not like 
the new stories to to Western culture, they showed up and started being used 1500 years ago officially, but they are, you know, 1500 year old versions of 35,000 year old stories. And there's no way, even on just a depth psychological basis, there's no way you will adequately embed in your culture without in some sense getting right with that and that doesn't mean like oh well off you go to church it's i mean the opposite of that you have to jailbreak all this potent stuff out from underneath it and i think we're a bit behind on that i think that's basically where we're at so what you're saying there is is this well to answer your question the the presence of the serpent in the garden which is a foundational myth for the cultures we were raised in is a way into that form that's exactly what I was trying to get to. So I was just going to transition out of the dragon then, because you mentioned Ursula Le Guin's passing just last week, right? And yeah. for people that don't know who she is, famous American novelist, she wrote in the fantasy genre, but I'm not really sure what that distinction means anymore. And we could talk about that. That's a whole other conversation probably. But you wrote a, uh, a blog post in the wake of her, her death, and it was very emotional and heartfelt. And, you know, you could tell in the writing how much her work meant to you and, and how much it impacted and affected you and that aspect of the blog really resonated with me because I think you and I are both at a point in our lives where we're probably reading more nonfiction, more academic, you know, research type writing. I think I think that comes with the territory, right? You know, you host a podcast, you're kind of stuck sometimes yeah. and don't get to read much for pleasure. But that nonfiction type of writing, I don't think has the same emotional impact or emotional influence over somebody. So I'd like to ask you, you know, what was it about her work specifically that made such an emotional impact on you hmm you you can smell the authentic you know the real when you encounter it and so it was particularly earthsea and and sort of like middle earth but differently it's real it's a real place uh, you you get into those books and it coming back to that not using empiricism to describe something you i can smell I can smell the, the sea air in, in Earthsea, like it's physically real. So it was just wondrous to go through that. Um, so that was probably one of the things that resonated with me. But it's the subsequent revisiting and, and thinking with Earthsea and its philosophy that I think is what stuck with me. Because the magic, in a different way, so in Lord of the Rings, the, the magic is very Northern European animist. So You'll remember it from the movie, but so when Saruman and Gandalf, uh, well, when they're trying to pass the path of Caradhras and, and Saruman's causing the storm and Gandalf's trying to co um, calm the storm, what they're actually saying is Saruman's trying to wake up the mountain and Gandalf's telling it to go back to sleep. And so there's a way into the magic of Middle Earth that you can use in actual magic. Um, so in in your waking life, that's a pure form of animism that is kind of engaging with and, and attempting to either subdue or wake up spirits. You can't really do that with Earthsea because the, the magic is, it's, it's a perfect system, but it's one that doesn't match how I would say magic works in the waking world. And so that's not the point of it. It's always weird, like Middle Earth can kind of teach you how to interact magically with you know, upper earth or wherever we are. What Earthsea does is think about or think with the fact that it, magic even works in the universe at all. Because Ursula Le Guin was a Taoist and, well, she was a lot of things, but she had a 50-year interest in Taoism. And Taoism is riddled with sorcery and magic and all kinds of delightful stuff and ghosts and exorcisms and talismans and all the really cool things. But there's something that jars about that when you you think about it. So Taoism is a, is a flow model, essentially. And magic seeks to adjust the flow or, or have it flow one way or the other. So it is it jars with a flowing universe. And what and not to give it away because I do recommend people read these books. But when you get to the end of all her kind of Earth Sea stories she has this marvelous way of explaining how magic came into Earthsea uh, and also how what that means for the world. So she created this or, or encountered this entirely new and, and fantastical non-physical realm that we can visit. And within it, if Middle Earth can teach you how to do magic, Earthsea can kind of give you the morality of, of how to live in a universe where magic works. And so that for me was really profound and has stuck with me and is probably i mean after she died i went and I, I thought about that because we were talking about it in the premium members forum and i sort of realized that it what she thought about magic in the universe has quite 
potentially profoundly influence how I kind of morally position magic in the universe myself. So there's that. And then there's her as a human, her as a human who literally transformed a genre from the, the kind of you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is Conan the Barbarian approach of it being a very male hero's journey to opening up the space for women, for non-binary, for non-white cultures. And she did it effortlessly. She, this is very Taoist of her, but she did it by just doing the work. There wasn't arguments. There wasn't, you know, um, yelling at conferences about representation or, or any of that stuff. Her unbelievable creative skills meant that she brought these things into the world and changed the entire publishing industry because she really was that good and that's taoist magic that is that is water right there and i just think she's one of the most remarkable writers who wrote in the english language who ever lived yeah i think in your blog you called her one of the top 10 and i mean that's high praise but i think if you analyze her body of work uh, you could definitely make that case well yeah so consider and I said top 10 of all writers who ever lived in any language anywhere. Now, what we were just talking about with regards to archetypes and the hero's journey and so on means that we're dealing with extremely old forms, tens of thousands of years old. And if you will struggle to find versions of those story prior to Ursula Le Guin that are more invitational to, I mean, her, her science fiction was about uh, non-binary, transgender kind of uh, sexual encounters. It was about anarchism. Uh, and then you get to Earthsea and it's about women and, and, and female magic and power in, in a world run by men. And not a, this makes it sound boring. I didn't even want to say that because I want people to read the books because it's so much more than that. And she was like an over the cloud update for mythology because you will struggle to find sufficient representation, which is important for engagement with these ancient forms prior to her. And that as I was writing the words, I'm like, my goodness, what a remarkable thing to have actually done, to have essentially democratized the most transformative archetypes and, and landscapes that we have as humans encountered over the last tens of thousands of years. That's that's not a small thing. And if you remember, I don't know how often she uses it throughout the Earthsea series, but she does refer, or she uses this phrase, art magic. It's a hyphenated word, but she describes it that way, art magic. And that ties into the theme of our conversation here. And I went through and uh, flipped through the first book of, of Earthsea when she died, and I saw that phrase in there. And I was like, I don't remember that at all. But, you know, I haven't read that book for probably 10 or 15 years. So it is interesting that, you know, she was writing about art as magic, magic as art, and that's essentially the same thing, right? She also, for someone who, I mean, she knew that it was in some sense real, like you get that in, in a lot of her talks, and, and she did do her own version of um, the Tao Te Ching and, and so on. So you know that she knows it's real, but she got the politics of of it right of and these are potentially not very useful terms but high magic and low magic and and male magic and female magic and so you have female witches who aren't allowed to go to the academies and so on kind of snatching and and stealing stuff that should be theirs that isn't and and uh, because they're kind of operating in the margins of a world where there is an official magic and there's theirs and the whole thing is is a profound walk through living in a universe where where magic works and and what that means and and what maybe you as a reader should do about it so there's also a phrase that she uses called uh, true speech. You know, it's capitalized whenever it appears. George R.R. R. Martin uses similar phrasing with high speech, you know, in, in his stories. So I'm wondering from your perspective, in this reality that we're all sharing right now, what would the truest or the highest speech be? What language could they be referring to exactly? See, that is, that's why it doesn't, you won't get magical tech out of Earthsea because when she talks about true speech, you have – well, you, this is, the world is linguistically created in the beginning was the word uh, or the sound om. And if you look at ancient Egyptian cosmology, you get a very similar idea that the words of the creator bring creation into being. So that's what true speech and so on is. And and whilst that's archetypally valid, from an operant magic perspective, it's less valid. It doesn't port out into the world as well as trying to make a mountain go to sleep or wake up, because you can, with practice, get to that sort of spirit engagement. So to answer your question, what is true speech in our reality? I would say true speech is, is the language of the unconscious. So it's not... You won't you won't get the same effects that you get in Earthsea if you learn Sanskrit or you know teach yourself 
hieroglyphics, which you can't speak, but it's it's at least uh, that kind of potent language. True speech, if you capitalize it, is the language of the unconscious. And if you do learn that language, if you do learn how to speak with and, and have it be heard, you will transform your life. You'll transform the entire universe. So that would be how I would port it out. But that's kind of what I mean. It doesn't, um, there's less useful tech for lazier chaos magicians to pull out of that than there is in, in thinking about the magic of the Lord of the Rings. So I want to wind down our conversation here. I actually have a kind of a game plan. What I did was I was, I was thinking about, I had John Michael Greer and John Crowley on the show not too long ago. And John Michael Greer told John Crowley that he thought that John had the best representation of hermeticism that he'd ever seen in fiction. And it got me to thinking like, well, what are some other magical stories and, and, and films and things like that that might compete with that? And I started making a list and I got to like, I think 41 or 42 things. And I was like, I'm just going to stop here. But what I did was I cut up that list. I put all the names and, and writers I had in a hat and I'd like to draw a few of them out of the hat and ask you what you think of the magic, or I, I guess general metaphysics too, of whatever I draw. Do you yeah, mind? that sounds great. All sure. Right, cool, I, cool. I just want to, off the top of my head, I would agree with John Michael Greer. If you're talking specifically hermeticism, I think that's a reasonable statement about John Crowley's work. Well, that's great because I was going to ask that, but I thought, oh, no, it's probably too obvious to ask that. But I have a note here, you know, what do you think is the best portrayal of hermeticism or any other occult or magical belief system in fiction? But that that gets a little wider. So, yeah, specifically hermeticism, that's the best depiction of it in in novelistic form, for sure. All right. So I'm going to get my hat here, which you can't see, obviously, but uh, I, I legitimately, if you can hear it. I have 42 scraps or like 41 scraps of paper in here. So I'm just going to draw the first one out. And if you don't know some of these, that's fine. Just say pass and we'll go on to another one. But uh, the first one I have, I think you're familiar with, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Uh, the world? The world is fun. I, I Colors of Magic is Pete Carroll's favorite uh, and, and how he structures Chaos Magic's Practical Enchantments is into those eight colors. So in that sense, the eight color model is surprisingly useful in in kind of carving up different ways of, of doing magic. So instead of um, the seven planets, he used the the eight colors of magic, including Octarine. So that it's useful in that sense. Obviously, it's a I mean Pratchett was for his sins a materialist. Obviously, it's a silly metaphysics because that's not what he was trying to do. But even out of that silly metaphysics, there is useful categorization. Don't you think it's ironic that he's writing in that genre and he's a materialist? I just kind of, well, I have the, the laughter or uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Oh, not, as, not as bad as condescension, but when I see people like that, I just kind of smile, uh, especially as he's now dead. So he's worked out he's wrong. Uh, and I just kind of <laughs> laugh. But it's almost like George R. R. Martin and the Dragons. For whatever reason, the unconscious picked Terry Pratchett. And, and that's how we have Discworld. Have you read all 41 Discworld novels? I have not. I haven't either, and I don't know if I ever will. But I, I, I don't think I, there's a, I like yeah. I, I read properly. I think all the death ones. Um, I thought they were good, and I've read uh, Colors of Magic. But no, there's too many. There's too many, and the jokes. Yeah. He's funny for the first ten books, I would say. And this is, sounds really mean, speaking ill of the dead. Like, if you haven't read any Terry Pratchett, Colors of Magic's very good. Any of the books that have death in them are very good. But the humor, after over 41 books, you kind of see the jokes coming. <laughs> For sure, man. Okay, so I'm going to draw another name out of the hat here. Pan's Labyrinth. Have you seen it? Seen it. Love it. Okay, well, what do you make of the magic and general metaphysics in Pan's Labyrinth? Uh, I would say it is one of the best ever depictions and approaches... I think it approaches perfection in depicting the interplay of and sameness of underworld, spirit world, unconscious, and waking world. I think it approaches perfection. I think it's it's one of the ones at the top. Would you group the rest of Del Toro's more fantastical body of work into that same description? Is it close to perfect? Uh, they no, um, they're good. But the Pan's Labyrinth is is perfection in, in in terms of how how that interplay is described in in childhood experience and and life and pain and personal struggles and and not even these are the old descriptions again, but which parts are real and which parts aren't and so on. 
they're very good and actually the the metaphysics in in some of the others are, are fine but it, it, they are all because pan's labyrinth is so good it's it, they're distant seconds yeah that's that's definitely i think one of the best movies i've I've ever seen. I mean, just not even considering genre. I, I just love it so much. Uh, oh, it's a straight up masterpiece. I, yeah, I, yeah. I watch it a couple of times a year. I don't blame you, man. I'm going to draw another name out here. True Blood. Seen it? I watched the first few series, yeah. What did you make of the, uh, I guess, of the world, the metaphysical world in True Blood? Hmm. <clears throat> Interesting question. The vampire stuff is silly, but whatever. When, uh, what was the name of the black gay guy? With the bandana. Oh, yeah. I don't remember his name, but yeah. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when he starts getting into the sort of African diaspora magic in the South, that was actually quite good. That was – obviously, it's Hollywoodized, but it, it, had, a, it, it had quite a good aesthetic uh, match for the sort of darker end of diaspora magic. So there's some good bits in there too. Yeah, and if you didn't stick with it, there was – well, I think even they introduced it pretty early in the series, but that that element of that that fairy world on like the other side of the veil, do you remember that aspect to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are better depictions of that. Jonathan Strange and M. Norrell, for instance, most recently as the BBC series. Obviously, the book, I actually find the book boring, but the, me t- the me BBC too, series yeah. was I- I'm, really I'm glad good. you said that. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, Gordon, because I have had arguments about that book with people where they... They, I don't know what it is, but I, I read it and I was like, this, this is what this is not very good. About. It's weird, yeah. cutesy, like fairy tale language that goes on too long. It's boring and and like the sound of its voice, um, way too much. It was a overwritten book that was destined to be uh, an excellent TV series. Well, that title is in here. I hope I don't draw it because we we don't really need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to draw another one. Oh, Neil Gaiman. Now, come on, Neil. I mean. You have to be fond of Neil, right? Sure, sure. I think he's another one of those pseudo-materialists. And I actually don't like him. I've met him. I actually don't like him that much. <laughs> I like his work better than I like him as a person. I think sure. when he gives his talks, there's this sort of faux whimsy, like Americans are still impressed with an English accent. Um, some of them are, but like the expat game gets a bit old after 20 years. So Sandman is obviously where he wins on that and in particular death um she is a she's one of the best depictions of death uh, and and some of the wisdom that she comes out with my my favorite being when she says everyone gets the same thing we all get one lifetime and that's when you kind of get a sense of him have really thought of the idea of, of of death as a person because that's one of those strange notions that is difficult for the mind to wrap its head around and you can kind of smell that in in sacred texts as well it's, speaking of university going back to the beginning of the conversation when we were looking at cross-cultural storytelling we were looking at the bhagavad gita and uh, the point where i think it's um, arjuna says that he doesn't he's lining up to go to war against his cousins and he says i you know i don't want to kill my cousins and god essentially so krishna says i have already killed all these men and it's just occasionally there's an idea that shows up that doesn't come from a a a human mind if you will and and death in the sandman series is one of those it's that particular archetype or that form uh, found neil and and got him to write her into it and uh, i like that I, I like some of the other books as well i mean american gods is not a good series this is the opposite of jonathan strange right american gods is not a good series but it is a fantastic american like road novel and it's interesting not being american um you see you can read in american gods neil's love letter to america like why he lives there and i I, and that because i can see i see the appealing things particularly if you're from england or somewhere that's small uh, america's bigness and it's also weird sameness you know with chain stores and and so on you could see him really wrestling with it that's when you get american gods which is of course about a sort of melting pot migration i mean that's what it is this is his big love letter to america and i don't maybe american readers don't get that but um people who live outside the u.s who are americophiles like me can see exactly what he was um, wrestling with there so the novel is great stars did you know they tried their best with the tv series and i'll continue to watch it but it's it's not as good as the book definitely yeah i was gonna draw one more and i had two i had two of the papers just fell out of the hat and one of them was alan moore's name so i feel like i do have to ask you because we brought him up earlier what do you 
I mean, obviously, he's practicing ceremonial magician, so his magic is pretty on point. But what do you make of the metaphysics in his fiction? Well, he's written stuff that has very different uh, metaphysics. So, I mean, we can talk about Alan's descriptions of how magic and fiction work and are the same and so on. And they're they're good. They're, I would say they're necessary but insufficient. So when he says that um, the one place that the gods can inarguably be said to exist is in the human imagination, where they are real in all their terror and glory, or whatever the statement is, you sort of quibble with the one place. So he's right when he's talking about how we experience wider reality through the imaginal. That's all very good. Unfortunately, what I would suggest is it fails. And I understand why, because he's talking to an audience. The comics audience is not as magic friendly as you might think. Uh, and so I understand that he's trying to bridge between people who haven't thought about it and have inherited an idiotic materialism and people who've been in magic for longer than he has. You want to fold in the psi results and the, and the actual real physical effects of practical enchantment into what he says, and then you get a really exciting model. But all the stuff he says about the imagination being real is very similar to the conversation we were having earlier. Like It is these ridiculous empirical categorizations that tell us otherwise that are out of date and uh, don't apply to the physical anymore let alone the imaginal so yes he's um you could uh, you will certainly learn a lot from uh, listening to alan moore talk about magic we don't have to talk about this but the other the name that fell out was the novels of dion fortune have you read any of her fiction i have read one of them ages ago um is there, is there one called sea priestess I read one of them ages ago because I stole it from the house of a kid I was babysitting. His sister had that and Dion Fortune's uh, mystical Kabbalah. And um, he said, these are my sisters. Do you want them? And I'm like, um, yes. So I didn't really steal, but like a 10-year-old <laughs> gave me books that didn't belong to him. So it's kind uh, of stealing. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the Sea Priestess uh, was published in 1938. Yes. So that's the one I've read. It was either Priestess or Moon something, but I read The Sea Priestess. They are a fascinating, fascinating snapshot of the worldview associated with Victorian magical orders. So giving, you know, it's 100 years later, so fine. Maybe we don't think the same way. and Maybe we don't have the same kind of hot takes about different races that you get in, in those books. In, in, that, in, in that book in particular, she, there, there's a scene where there's a Buddha that's being used as a, a, a doorstop or it's on the stairs or something. And she's suspecting that because the Buddhists use, are known to use blood sacrifice, that this could be like the location of the curse. And you go, that's not correct, Dion. <laughs> that's not a thing that happens. I mean, Tibetan shamanism, yes. But so there's the kind of, you get the Edwardian English view of non-white races in it, uh, which is different to saying it's a racist book. She's It was a product of the time. But you, it's a really interesting way of uh, looking at the worldview that's associated with Victorian orders, which is a lot more theosophical than uh, than people realize. And is not immediately apparent if you do something like read Israel Regardi's Stolen Golden Dawn Papers. Um, you, you get how it's lived in that. And uh, whilst it's not, I would say, a roadworthy metaphysics in the 21st century. It's it's historically interesting to to look at it. So I appreciate you uh, being a uh, I don't know what the right word is here, but yeah, my my game guinea is pig, over. guinea pig, yeah, for yeah, the yeah. That, that, that's the first time I've done that. And I thought you know what, Gordon would be the the best person to to try this with because I you have such a diverse magical background, obviously that, and I know that you like stories. I, I know that you like to read and watch a lot of films and, and and TV series because you know that really is a a nice way to absorb culture and metaphysics. I don't think people realize you know how much they're really subjected to in fiction sometimes. But as we get to the end here, I have some listener questions sort of like a rapid fire type of thing if you just give me a sentence or two like you don't have to elaborate much further than that but they're just kind of meant to be rapid fire cool sure all right so uh, as someone who is a permaculturalist does gordon incorporate plants into his magical practice Yes, absolutely. Less so at the moment, although we're, I'm kind of building it in my shed uh, right now, less so at the moment from a kind of extraction, tincture, distillation. That's my winter project. But what you find in, in a lot of the kind of early modern and even earlier texts is that certain plants have 
different effects so you plant rosemary out the back and you you're not going to get ghosts and and that kind of stuff so i use the language of plants as living things uh, incorporated into place magic and if if i got the question in because obviously we're heading into winter here if i got the question in the spring i i talk to you about my distillery what plants uh, specifically do you use well, I've, I've just moved here, so whichever ones are around, unfortunately, now. But I would yeah. use St. John's wort. And generally, what I like plants for in a very beginning house magic sense is pick the ones that are protective uh, and and go with them to start with. And you you kind of learn the language straight away there. And, and the main ones are St. John's wort. The ones that are associated with banishing ghosts and spirits and so on are St. John's wort and rosemary, both very easy to grow. And then you can start hanging things, um, you know, like hyssop and whatever in the windows. But if you can get St. John's wort and rosemary to grow and you and you feed the uh, rosemary red wine on St. John's Eve, you are doing ghost busting. Does Gordon think cryptocurrency slash blockchain is a form of sorcery? Well, um, all all money is. So... Yes, it is. It's dangerous enough to be. There's a tremendous amount of money to be made, and a lot of people will lose a lot of money. So uh, that's that's quite magical in its own way. But yes, of course, magic is that, and and magic and debt and and so on emerge from the gloom of history, along with the Sumerians. So we like we got it from the demons. It's as simple as that. Um, there's a presentation in the premium members area, Campfire's Edge, which looks at which things probably came from the spirit world by virtue of our interaction with it, and specifically Western which cryptocurrency is because it wasn't invented by this Japanese guy who doesn't exist. Specifically, Western modes of using debt and and fiat money have have had quite the impact on the world. What does Gordon think of the term woke? Is this a trendy social media... (laughs) Hold on, hold on. Is this a trendy social media hashtag movement? A particular group co-opting what is otherwise a legitimate spiritual phenomenon or something else completely? Do you know, I think, uh, well, obviously woke refers to, I think it's having a second life now as being used ironically, because it was initially used to, you know, express centrist, progressive opinions. And then it was used disparagingly as a result. And now I think it's being used kind of ironically in a fun way. Generally, I would identify as a progressive anyway. So um, I, I think the word is silly, but what it initially described is, uh, you know, people trying to live in the world and, and be less of a dick. And, and I think that's nice. Um, but I, it's, yeah. it's having a second life now that you can have. Yeah. Now that you can use it ironically. Last listener question here. Does Gordon listen to the Cocteau twins? <laughs> is this? Yeah, I have. <laughs> Uh, obviously, if this is Chris Knowles related, yeah. um, if I have any, if I have any cocktail twins questions, I just ask Chris on Skype, and obviously he knows them. They are remarkable. I mean, she she was is I don't you don't want to use past tense when she's still alive, but it's not like she's performing. Um, right. They were obviously hugely influential, and and um, it's a really good sound. Okay, I don't want to open up because we're towards the end of our time here. But you know what what do you make of this Chris Knowles siren song apocalypse like? Well, it's an excellent example of archetypes close to the surface, because this is, we were talking about this yesterday, Chris and I, in fact, and I said that if Elizabeth Fraser was alive in classical Greece, they would have bundled her into a cave and filled it with snakes and made her a sibyl. There is something very otherworldly about how she sounds, but also, as, as Chris has looked at, um, synchromysticism is is kind of observing the independent life of symbols. Uh, and there is something about how she lived and, and the symbols she generated in terms of song lyrics and, and motifs that has had curious and damaging and uplifting and, and bizarre matches to reality over the course of her career. That's a sibyl. That's what they do. Prophetesses, you know, um, screeching predictive magic spells down cave systems in ancient Greece. So I think that's what she is. I think that's a form, that's an archetype or a form coming close to the surface of reality, if you will. And just to tie up the discussion here, last question for me. You have a, a traditional first question for first time guests on your podcast. You know, were you a weird kid? It's a fantastic question to start with because it, it gives some great context to how, you know, your guests got to where they are now in their journey of, of self discovery. And I have a, a sporadic 
last question that I asked to guests who I think can not only offer a unique and thoughtful answer, but also because I think it gives a different sort of context to how they got to where they are now. And honestly, I couldn't think of a better question to ask you to wrap this up because I can't say I've heard you talk much about this subject. So Gordon White, what is love and what does it have to do with all of this? It is a very good last question, isn't it? Hmm. I don't know. I, like, I have this conversation with Alex at Skeptico a bit because he he's extracted from, and potentially correctly, I don't know, from looking at near-death experience data over the last however many years he's been doing it, that the universal message people come back from the afterlife with is it really is all about love, that that, that song is correct, that appears to be how things run. So, It's probably important. It is probably, as in, it obviously is important, but I mean, it's probably functionally important to the universe. It's probably how, how to describe this. So that it's a divided for the chance of union thing, right? I think the encounter with love is a, or the experience of love is a filter free moment of unity with however you want to call, you know, the divine, the living universe, whatever. So it is it is that whether or not it's uh, it's required for the world to run or whether or not occasionally you just kind of see through the mechanics and and or experience through the mechanics and have that moment i'm not sure i'm not sure if there are moral implications to the fact that love exists in the universe there probably are but that's what i think it is i think it it's when there is no filter between you as your full and complete self not just a physical one and if you want to say god uh, god and uh, even if it's not a uh, required or even if it's not the rules the fact that that's the case is gives makes it a useful yardstick for moving through the universe so even if it's not a binary like you have to find love or you haven't done life correctly even if it's not that it's a useful guide like a marco polo guide through life like always go towards love and not away from it sort of thing Well, that's why I ask those questions, man, because every answer I get is different from the last one. And I knew you would have a good perspective on that. So, you know, we could talk for another couple hours because I have like 35 other names in this hat. But we're we're not going to do that. You've got to save names for the next guest. Yeah, I got some of the good ones. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they're all good. It's just that, yeah, we, we pulled out some of the some of the bigger names in there for sure. So, but you know, Gordon White, everybody knows where to find you. RuneSoup.com. Uh, the podcast is everywhere. Is there anything else you'd like to, to plug and promote? No, just if you're keen, RuneSoup.com. That's where the podcast and all the stuff is. It's obviously on Facebook. Uh, and yeah, it was fun. It was a fun chat. Well, thank you, man. I do appreciate your time, and it means quite a bit to me, to this point in my timeline, to to borrow some language from you, that, that you're here with me now. So thanks again, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Of course, anytime. Sha fucking zam. My thanks again to Gordon White. Give the old rune soup a taste if you haven't yet. It's definitely one of the more valuable navigational tools to consult if you're lost and looking for some direction on this sea or any other. And Gordon himself is quite the ship captain. I appreciate his sportsmanship as he played along with my rather shallow name out of the hat game. But I think there were some valuable nuggets that came out of that. I feel like I could have picked out something like My Little Pony and Gordon could have gave us a treatise on why bronies are a symbolic return to a specific feminine archetype in modern western culture. Not that I'm making that connection myself here, but you get the gist. I should also point out that I typed bronies into my Word document here, and it did not command a red underline. Make of that what you will. Gordon did message me after our chat to tie up one loose end here, and that was to let me know his favorite novel published post-1970. It's Kraken by China Mievel. So for anyone constructing the official Rune Soup reading list, make sure to include that one. And I was quite glad Gordon had not only heard of House of Leaves, but was also fond of it. I don't meet a lot of folks who've heard of it, let alone read it, and let alone enjoyed it. But it is one of my favorites, uh, if not my favorite, novel. And maybe if Gordon is up for it, we could take a deep dive into that and some other fictions. Because that really is, as I told him, one of my great passions. I did like his point that there are just stories, and labeling them this or that is part of the hijack. And admittedly, I'd not thought of it that way, but I think you have to agree with that. You know, this episode makes a good companion and also a nice contrast in a way with the last episode with Andrew Austin, where we looked at magic and psychology and psychotherapy. Obviously, this conversation channeled the artistic impulse that we all possess in some form or another. 
And when you pair both these episodes with our next one, you will have a complete picture of what O-Culture is, both as a podcast here and as a modern Western modality. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and come back because this story is being written one episode at a time, both consciously and subconsciously, and I hate for you to miss a chapter because you never know what characters will show up and what sort of ruckus they'll cause. Some days you'll get the fairy tale happy ending, and some other days you'll get the red wedding. And if you can, please do consider supporting the show in whatever way you can. The easiest way is to rate and review on iTunes, preferably 5 stars, before it's cool too. If you want to contribute to the show monetarily, our Patreon campaign is new and ongoing over at patreon.com slash occulture. Four levels of support there, all with varying rewards. And if a recurring monthly thing isn't your thing, oculturepodcast.com slash donate has some different one-time donation options, including some in cryptocurrency. You can also grab a t-shirt at oculturepodcast.com slash merch or on our Etsy store. All this stuff is linked in the show notes. And I think that is all the gratuitous marketing plugs I have this time, which means I gotta get out of here. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.